Hey, what's going on guys? Comic Gains here. I'd like to start this video by answering two most significant questions uh, we need to get an answers for. So the first one is why actually to learn 6502 assembly? And the second question is why am I doing this tutorial series? And uh, I will probably start from the second question and here is the point. So there are really lots of uh, absolutely tremendous tutorials on uh, 6502 assembly language but the problem is that most of them uh, well I, I would say probably all of those uh, I, I've, I've been encountering when I was searching for some information so all of the tutorials I've been encountering are actually dedicated to the specific hardware so this might be either NES or Commodore 64 or whatever other computers that are actually built uh, using this absolutely legendary uh, 6502 processor I just uh, yeah here is the list of the computers by the way where uh, it has been involved so it's really it's really kind of like uh, impressive list to say at least so Apple 2 Atari 20 uh, 26 200 so Atari 5200 BBC Master BBC Micro Commodore 64 even Tamagotchi used this I didn't know this this is so cool and and many others that I don't even know that they, they have existed, uh, to be honest. Because uh, my very first computer was ZX Spectrum and it uses it used the Xilog's Z80 processor and I had no idea about this computer's exists like when I was a kid at least. So yeah, I just, uh, I'm getting interested in, in this sort of thing just, just now being aged almost 33. Okay, so... Uh, here is the point. Uh, if if we're not even talking about setting up the development environment to say, to let's say, start coding for, let's say, for NES, right? It's quite pretty painful to do if you didn't do this before. And also, most tutorials uh, teaching how to do this on Windows. Well, I'm on Linux, so that doesn't make any sense to me. And so on. So, really lots of things that you can really uh, uh, jump in. Uh, quite easily, so that's the problem, and that's only the half of the problem. And the the other problem is that you actually, uh, instead of being focused on learning the assembly on its own, you need to be distracted by the uh, specifications of the target hardware you're coding for. And well, you might argue that if you run if you're writing in assembly, then the idea initially is actually to be as close to how to hardware as possible and that's definitely the case but i just want to say that uh let's say for nes in order to set up the project to prepare it to start writing the hello world program it really needs lots of things to do and it needs uh, quite a good understanding of how the uh parts like cpu ppu like APU and all, all, all of these parts uh, kind of interact uh, with each other in order to uh, make sure you know how to initialize them properly. So it already involves uh, quite solid hardware knowledge and understanding of how things are working under the hood. So the problem is that I haven't encountered any tutorial on 6502 assembly language uh, that would be kind of like software focused and for me personally, that's one of the most important things because if we're talking about the programming language, I mean, if this is assembly, uh, I really want to learn like uh, being focused on the soft software uh, kind of part of the language. Okay, but obviously it's not possible. It's not really possible to uh, completely separate uh, the processor and uh, from from the hardware, obviously. But the compromise uh, is actually this legendary environment, which has involved to its current state, uh, not, not, not at first time, it just was really uh, like several stages and I would like to cover them as well here because uh, whatever, well anyway, uh, whatever 6502 tutorial actually does involve uh, getting familiar with the environment it's emulating and in this case it's better to say the environment it is simulating. So uh we'll get into this just right in the moment but i just want to generally i just want to say that this kind of environment it's uh you can run it uh in the browser just navigate to the link that's pretty much all about it 
then you can write code, uh, 6502 assembly code. Uh, you can you have this 32 by 32 pixels display. You have absolutely tremendous debugger, so you 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 can inspect the values for the registers, uh, uh, where where the stack pointer is, where where the program counter is, all the uh, all the registers uh, are like uh, this processor flags. Uh, you can inspect, uh, if you uh, enable the monitor, you will be able to inspect the uh, RAM, the random access memory. And you can literally control every single part. And this, this environment is very simple, but it's very comfortable to work with uh, when the purpose of doing this is learning. And now we're coming uh, softly from the question of why am I doing this tutorial series? So to uh, be focused on uh, the software, uh, kind of like uh, tr trying to present the material from the software perspective, from, so from the programming languages perspective, uh, without uh, relying much on the hardware, because uh, the way uh, the hardware emulation here is extremely simplified, and we'll, we'll get into this just right in the moment, okay? And I believe that the original goal behind creating this uh, project was actually to help people uh, trying to learn a 6502 assembly uh, in a hardware agnostic way, I would say like that probably. And you know, like uh, it does it does the trick really. So when I've been playing around with this environment, it's, it's really cool. You can just uh, directly straight ahead focus on coding without getting getting distracted by how the internal uh, uh, hardware uh, details kind of interacting with each other. So uh, the second question we're coming to is why to learn. Uh, and again, like the environment itself actually has the goal to learn 6502 assembly for uh, just uh, from the educational perspective. But um, let me try to gonna cover this in a little bit more details because I personally consider it to be very important. So I came up, uh, I came to 6502 assembly from the x86 assembly backgrounds. Uh, uh, I've been uh, writing some uh, real mode 16-bit operating system uh, to load, to play and even develop boot sector games and apps. That's that, that was wasn't really a serious project. It was just like uh, a hobby project of mine. But anyway, so uh, uh, I had that experience writing in x86 assembly. But uh, when I've uh, realized uh, the architecture of 6502 processor, and when I've realized that it kind of like uh, how minimalist it is, how elegant it is, and how cool and how fun it is. Uh, I, I've realized why people say often that uh, if you're about to start learning how to code in assembly, you really should consider 6502 first and then go to x86. It wasn't my case, but now uh, I believe that if I was just right about to start learning assembly, I would definitely kickstart with the 6502 because it's very basic and Unlikely the x86, it uh, allows you to think uh, in assembly way uh, much faster because, uh, you know, like x to today's x86 is so feature rich, there are so many instructions and the assemblers has a very kind of like quite pretty complicated syntax that it feels almost like you're writing in C, but just with the access to the direct hardware and a little bit different syntax. And well, but generally, you know, like, uh, well, for me personally, when I switched from C to x86 assembly, I didn't really feel that much of a difference, to be honest, because it was about doing almost the same things, but in a slightly different way. So for me personally, it was the matter of a, a bit different syntax, probably. Uh, even though it's different, quite different, but anyway. But but when I tried uh, when I tried to do a very very simple things with 6502 assembly, uh, I realized that uh, I don't know how to code in assembly. It's not the matter of knowing the particular architecture behind 6502. It's the matter that the way how I was thinking in assembler was actually wrong because uh, it worked for me just because uh, uh, the x86 is really feature rich. But in uh, 6502. 
uh, you have only three general purpose registers. They are only 8-bit and it's really challenging to do very simple things. And the way how the architecture works, the way how the uh, these internal commands uh, uh, of the process are going to interact with, with each other in order to uh, make some trivial things is really is really is, is cool is very fun and definitely worth of learning so I don't know uh, it's it's some sort of an internal feeling that you don't you don't even need to have a proper goal to achieve something in order to get motivated to learn this language because just the bare understanding of how cool it is is already a good enough motivation to start playing around with it and one of the goals that I have uh, by starting this tutorial is actually to show you guys like uh, trying to show you this beauty and uh, I will try to make this uh, tutorial series uh, for absolute beginners so if you even if you don't have an experience in programming in general uh, this still should be possible to follow these tutorials because uh, it's not really about that much about programming, right? It's more like about the way how to think and how to talk to processors in order to make it doing some some logical things that you need and having the output and that's pretty much all about it. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry for a bit too long intro, but uh, this is really important to to be said, like what I just said, because uh, I think that those who, who are still watching this video are exactly the guys this video is intended for. And on the other hand, those who stopped watching like a couple of minutes ago or five, ten minutes ago, that probably it's not for them. So let's consider this a bit of a filter. So if you're still watching, that probably you're interested. So without further ado, let's actually have a look uh, at the environment. So uh again like the diff the quite a difference uh between uh, the x86 and 6502 is that um well for me personally x86 is is more like uh just just a different way to write the same software uh so i don't really feel uh even though i i was kind of like uh reading sectors from USB flash drive, writing sectors, uh, uh, and accessing the video me memory directly. Still, it didn't really, well, it, it feels really close to hardware, but you know, like it doesn't really, I don't know, it's, it, it you kind of, you, I don't know, uh, probably this is just me, uh, but I just don't feel the hardware that great as I do in 6502 even though there is no real hardware behind this simulator it's called simulator and we'll now uh, figure out why it's called simulator and not the emulator even though it's very similar terms but there's quite a bit quite, quite a difference so yeah and here even though the hardware is simulated and probably can't even exist in, in the way how it works here still you have this feeling of the hardware and i hope you know i will now try to explain what exactly i mean by saying this but before we start uh let me just show uh, the evolution of this environment so all this started from the 6502asm.com website i have no idea uh, what's the year of starting this but it claims to be the world's first fantasy console and i've, I've been re reading through some uh, uh forum posts and no one actually argues with this so I believe that this is quite pretty rare and one interesting thing so we just inspect the element of the output that we see that it actually uh, tiny little uh, table cells which is very cute unlikely the today's version where we have simply a kind of a element so that's the update that has been done um, yeah here we have the canvas element so that's that's a very interesting thing so the, er the earlier versions actually <laughs> did involve uh, the table and, and I personally I, I love HTML tables from my uh, chess programming backgrounds it's, it's really cool so the way how it worked in the old browsers uh, when there was no canvas element at all it's it's really fascinating all right so just to give you an idea uh, before looking at the language before looking at the environment on it so just to give you an idea what you can do uh, using the 6502 language and this simulator and uh, it's called simulator by this guy nick morgan who has adopted 
uh, this beautiful thing. And uh, so where he calls this, yeah, assembler and simulator. So emulator is a program that uh, tries to uh, provide a software implementation of the hardware, of the certain hardware that exists. While the simulator uh, kind of like simulates something that doesn't really exist. And uh, also uh, in this particular case, uh, being a simulator means uh, to simplify the way how hardware works. So for instance, in order to, uh, in order to draw a single uh, pixel uh, on this display, it's just a matter of uh, writing a certain memory, a certain value to a certain memory location. And uh, on like on the real hardware, let's say like on NES, it's not that trivial, so it's way more complicated. But here it's simplified so much that you can just write this values uh, to the bytes at memory of the certain address range, which we'll cover just right in the moment. And you can have the pixels uh, kind of like appearing on the screen so uh, all we can program is how these pixels are shown and also we can actually make games using this because it also uh, allows to read uh, the ASCII characters from the keyboard I will cover this as well this is very important and it also has a built-in logic to get the random values without actually involving any processor instructions so just uh, the environment itself generates the, rem the random numbers for us which is very handy like a very quick and like very fast way to obtain a, a random value for your needs right so um just to give you an idea so here here is the list of the programs uh so it's quite pretty few so people who are writing for this world's force fantasy and soul uh and here uh, i'm not sure what's the scope of the game uh but oh uh, sorry uh, i'm not sure what is the scope of the game but here we have a player right um compile run okay so controls a s d and w so here we have the player that can explore the map well uh again uh, i have no idea what's the goal of the game but it looks very impressive assuming that we only have 32 by 32 pixels so we have you see like the character uh is drawn differently when it goes to different directions um uh it has a collision detection uh the background of the uh the background here and here is different which is also very cool thing so we can hit uh the walls okay again like collisions is action so and you can control the character and it's really fascinating so it's it's a roguelike game at some point i would uh, i would say okay so another thing so uh some visual effects are made in this kind of manner which is also cool i believe right so I'm not sure whether it lasts forever or not. Well, probably. Okay. So uh, it has uh, more advanced things like say this one. So this is known as the demo, and there is a culture like called demo scene. It's a great community focused at creating this like visual and sometimes audio effects as well. Uh, and just the state of art basically right so demos are cool another uh, this one is stated to be the very first demo for this imaginary console uh, so you see like even though we have only 32 by 32 pixels it actually quite pretty powerful so we can even draw the graphics here uh, and all the graphics is encoded within the within the byte map right so yeah uh that's that's what we have so just a few more uh just a few more well for instance uh somewhat somewhat some somewhat a simple one okay just noise oh this was this one is interesting just uh printing random pixels which is not really that trivial to do uh even though despite the fact the code is quite pretty short and looks simple right so what else um, I don't know. Well, this this one this one is interesting. So games, left, right, J, K. Uh, so we just scan, 
and if we hit the tree then the ambulance car is coming so this is really <laughs> this is really cool uh, so yeah uh, it's really you, you can you can do really a lot of things so first I thought like what the heck is this just the screen is so small it's not you can't do much with this but actually you do there is a snake game actually available uh, and by I'm not sure whether the Nick, Nick Morgan has done this the guy who is the author of this uh, brilliant tutorial maybe maybe someone else I'm not sure but just to give you an idea like how this the game of snake actually works uh, yeah here it is snake yeah so let's assemble run and I can play the game of snake which is so cool so I believe Tetris is also on the cards might be implemented as well and uh, all sort of a uh, brick games probably might be implemented here as well so it's really uh, really has kind of big potential I would say and yeah and by the way this this game is very tiny so it's only about slightly more than 512 bytes if we just have a look at the hex dump yeah just uh, 512 bytes stops here right so just a few bytes more but yeah it's, it's really cool here is the entire source code so yeah um, you can do really lots of things using this environment that's that's my message to you guys okay so without further ado let's actually dive into into the environment so what is this uh, what is it and how it works so we have uh, a nodes button here which gives us almost all the information we need so uh, member location FE contains a new random byte on every instruction. We'll now have a look how, it, how this works. Member location FF contains the ASCII code of the last key pressed. Uh, and member location starting from 200 hexadecimal and to 5FF hexadecimal uh, map to the screen pixels. So different va values would draw different colors. And here are the codes. So the values for bytes that we need to uh initialize this the certain memory range with in order to draw pixels on this tiny little display so it has the monitor well uh we don't we didn't yet uh learn any instructions so for now i just say loop and jump to loop uh so this is just uh it makes processor stuck in one place uh so before anything else i just want to show you this monitor but it, in order to make it work uh we actually need to well, a sec yeah I did I forgot just to say where to jump yeah obviously jump to loop so here is a uh, uh, like infinite loop here but uh, we need to do this to make to make it to assemble it and so so that this monitor actually shows up and I want to uh, have a look at uh, 100 hexadecimal bytes number of bytes all right so just assemble again and now I'm going to the debugger so here uh, this is the byte FE that has been mentioned in the notes right so every time so I make step this means that the program counter uh, so program counter is the register holding uh, the next instruction uh, for a processor to execute okay uh, so every time uh, it reads the next instruction and in this case it just uh, jumps to, to to the place where it currently is right uh, so see so like uh, step uh, the pro program counter is not getting changed because it's not going to the next instruction and it stucks where it is but here we have a new random number being generated so we can make use of it in, if we want to have some a randomization either for color or for location of a pixel or for whatever, for whatever logic let's say for snake where to put the apple so we can use this random byte so that's how we can do it right now uh, the next interesting thing so it regards to the controls so the memory location at FF contains the ASCII code of the last press of the last key press so let's say I press A I press I just pressed A and the uh, hexadecimal ASCII code uh, for A is 61 so now this byte should be 61 all right and before I now I press Y it changes now I press D it changes now I press S it changes again so 
uh, it just holds the very last key pressed and this may be used in order to uh, listen to the user controls. So if you want to make a game, let's say, uh, make a snake uh, crawling left, right, up and down, uh, depending on what key has been pressed, we can uh, reference uh, the user input in this byte. And again, like it's really simplified as opposed to how this works uh, on some real systems, right? But uh, this console uh, allows us to make it very in a very very simplistic way which doesn't uh distract us from actually programming to figuring out how, how the actual hardware works because we don't have the actual hardware because this is the simulator not the emulator all right now uh the very last thing in this notes but not the very last thing in generally so we'll also have a look at the stack uh, so here, uh, starting from uh, 200 hexadecimal into this one, uh, we can draw the pixels. So, uh, again, uh, we didn't yet learn any instructions, but uh, I just show you how this, how this memory works. So I just want to load the value of, let's say, color white, 0, 1. Uh, uh, well, I, I'm not going to be talking about the instruction now, uh, because it's going to be the topic of uh, of the next tutorials so for now I just say what I do so I just uh, load so I just load uh, one to a register and we didn't yet cover what the registers are as well but anyway and then I want to store this value at the memory address 200s and if I assemble and run then we have a pixel appears here so this is the verb first uh, place in memory. So let's get back to notes. So starting from here. And by the way, if you want to have a look uh, at this value in the memory map, you can do that as well. So in this case, you need to do to go to 200s. And well, that's the good number to number of bytes to show. So let's reassemble this. And actually, so here we have nothing now. Let's uh, enable the debugger. So step in, in, uh, initialize the first instruction we have the AA being initialized to 0, 01 and after we set this to memory and not only here but actually here so this memory cell so the, here uh, the thing uh, you can see here is known as the hex editor well to be exact it's the hex viewer because we're not actually editing here anything uh, in, in this window list so this 0, 01 you see like uh, it's on the screen but we actually what what happened underneath is we actually uh, initialized the certain memory location with this value so this is what's happening from just from the bare assembly language perspective and it just implemented the way that if we just write to the memory results in writing pixels on screen so this is a very handy thing to consider so let's say if we make just some somewhat a different color here and assemble and run so now we see like the color has changed. I can barely see this, but well, let's try to someone else. But here we have uh, by two. Okay, let's just try to play around with the different colors. Yeah, now this one is seen at very least. Okay, so let's say uh, I want to place uh, assembler like in the next place, like the next memory cell and the next memory cell, right? The next memory cell and eventually the very last one as stated here is is 5ff so if i just say 5ff and assemble and run we have the pixels in the bottom right part of of the display all right so uh this is what is known as memory location mapping to to the display pixels so uh, whenever we want to draw a pixel we just need to find a uh, corresponding memory cell in the random access memory so again like what we see here in the monitor is the random access memory uh, for instance if we call in a hex dump so this is the 6502 machine queues representing the uh, assembled instructions so this instructions turn turn into this machine codes and uh, we can actually see where this guy is located as well and in order to that's another interesting thing to consider so uh, how to know that this is really the case and this is really kind of uh, up there in there, right? So we have another uh, 
then the program counter so it's the pointer to the to the next instruction the processor is going to be executing so if we just grab this so this kind of like uh let's actually assemble again so by the so it starts with hexadecimal 600 so it's another important location to know right so we want to assemble and have a look here okay so if we just uh so let's say uh hex dump so here uh here is our program so the opcodes the values so the opcode for load uh uh load value to a a9 and the value itself 03 okay then uh opcode for store and the 16-bit value and note that uh, here the order is different so we don't have 05FF instead we have FF05 that's because that's happening because 6502 processor has the little Andean byte order uh, just like the x86 processor as well by the way so yeah uh, and this is how we can re this is how we can inspect uh, where uh, actually the, the actual bytes the program counter is pointing to so uh, so now currently it's pointing to a9 but if I make step so it executes this okay and now it points to 0 2 so it actually points here now okay so this is the next instruction uh, to execute it doesn't point to uh, 601 uh, because this is the value uh, corris that corresponds to the previous instructions instruction uh, the value the, the value to load the, uh, the a register with but instead it just points to 602 points here right to the next instruction and then this next two bytes is the argument to pass kind of like to pass to this instruction if you're if we're talking from if we're thinking from the high level uh, programming languages perspective Okay, so I hope this is clear uh, in regards to what the program counter is. Uh, where is the memory? Uh, uh, where is the video memory located? Uh, how can we uh, get the user input? And where can we uh, get a random byte if, if we need uh, to source the random number from somewhere? So that's uh, these are the things that are specific to this exact fantasy console. So if you're going to be developing for Commodore 64, for NES, for whatever other real uh, hardware being emulated, not simulated, but emulated, in that case, this knowledge will not help you because this kind of knowledge are only specific to this platform, which is, well, in my opinion, this is more like made for educational purposes, like with, with educational purposes in mind. And uh, it's really handy to have... The, uh, the, uh, the debugger in this way it's really cool to have the monitor um, so yeah uh, it's really kind of like a handy tool so you can control literally everything so every single uh, any, any tiny little movement you make you can see what uh, what in particular does it affect so this is very important okay so the next thing to consider is the stack pointer so uh, a few words about the stack so what is this? What is the stack, and why, what is this needed for? So uh, I would. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about the theory because it might take kind of too long. So just from uh, from the practical perspective. So the first way how the stack can be used is if we need to temporarily store the value. Uh, well, let's say we have a value in a register. And then we need to uh, initialize the A register with, uh, with, with a somewhat a different value. And then we need to restore the value back. So in order to do this, we can temporarily put the value to the stack. And the, the, how this works, uh, so well, uh, actually it's, it's better, uh, in, in, instead of naming this, it's really better to demonstrate. And what this nodes doesn't show is where the stack is located however fortunately uh, we can know this from uh, this nice tutorial by nick morgan so if we look for stack uh yeah the stack so here is the address for a stack so it starts from 100 hexadecimal and ends up here so uh the very first and the most simple instruction instruction to put data onto stack 
uh, so let's say yeah so here we did load one to a register and and here we did put one to memory location uh, hexadecimal 05 ff so yeah uh, uh, a few notes on the notation since we're already using some so this dollar sign uh, shows that we're dealing with a hexadecimal number and if you're not familiar familiar with hexadecimals you de definitely have a look uh, how they work basically well probably i will cover that uh in, in in a very fast way in the next tutorial when it comes to actually using these values but for now just enough to know the dollar sign says that we have the hexadecimal value well uh one of the interesting uh things that this simulator allows which probably no real emulator allows is to use the decimal numbers uh yeah i believe that the real hardware doesn't allow doing that but this emulator actually allows so, uh, yeah by the way uh a semicolon uh, stands for a commentary so we can say three like this and probably this should still yeah this still uh it kind of like uh puts three into the a register but i highly uh i don't recommend this I don't recommend doing so because if you if you really want to to write a real uh, 6502 code, uh, you really need to be, you really need to stick to hexadecimal numbers because that's well first of all that's classics and secondly it's much more hand, it's handier to to work with it's really handy to work with hexadecimals and we'll know why that again just going to be the topic of the next tutorial already. All right, so what else? Um, yeah, so the stack. Uh, let's go to the memory location 100. So we can keep this code. Actually, it doesn't, it's not needed anymore. But anyway, so uh, currently we have uh, a register holds the value of three and we can see it here as well. Well, it's a bit outdated information. We need to assemble again. Now it resets, right? So, and now let's say, push a so this is the one byte instruction that allows to uh, push uh, the value of mm, 3 which uh, a register holds to the stack right and uh, now let's assemble and uh, so where is where is where is this yeah and it goes downwards if I'm not mistaken the stack goes yeah so we uh, 1ff yeah, uh, I'm just not sure if this is enough space. So it should should appear here if just enough bytes being shown. Uh, so let me check this out. One, two, and three. Yeah, and it works. So uh, initially, stack pointer. So this is a special register. Uh, so initially, let's let's get assemble this again. Assemble. It only shows um, uh, the least significant byte. Uh, so here. It's like 01 FF, where the 01 is the most significant byte, and FF is the least significant byte. Because uh, all the registers are 8 bit, uh, so we have only. So FF, by the way, is the maximum value for a register to hold, right? So, um, yeah, let's, let's go again. So we assemble. So step one, uh, a three takes the value of uh, a register takes the value of three. Step two, uh, did I push this? Nope. Uh, I'm just wondering. Ah, oh, yeah, uh, it appears. I just I just didn't see it. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, guys. Sorry. Just let's let's start. Uh, let me just put it back to the as the very first one. It's easier to see that it actually works. So put the value of three to a register. The next step, uh, we just put. Uh, oh, sorry. It shouldn't be just not the very beginning. It doesn't matter really. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Put in a three to. A register then uh, at the memory location of 200 hexadecimal we uh, put whatever was in the a register and then the next step would be to push the value of 3 to the stack so next step and we have this value being stored here let's say if we have uh, here we ha let's say have uh, we want to load uh, let's say 4 to stack and push it again right in this case we will have 
is first we have this three being pushed and then the next step uh, we load four and then the next step we push another value now uh, also we can so this is the way how we uh, put data to stack so uh, the last uh, the last value that goes onto the stack would get back first if we pull that value so let's have a look how that works uh, so let's say here uh, I say load to a register I want to load zero so just to reset this and then I want to pull and then pull again so what I expect to see here so the register a uh, so we just push three and four and then the register a would get would get back to zero and then when we pull it first uh, gets the value of four and then gets the value of three so let's check this out it should be so uh, uh, right yeah oh, yeah debugger is on the cards um, so here it is now notice here so the next step should erase uh, the a register so it now contains the value of zero and the next step when it pulls it should be equal to four again and which it is right but uh actually well it pops the data from the stack but it uh, doesn't make it back zero so it's just a matter of moving the pointer uh yeah i'll probably demonstrate this uh, visually so just for a better understanding in, in the next run and then we have it's back to three so uh, the last element uh, that we pushed into the stack uh, comes back first. And uh, I'm not sure it's last in, first out. Yeah, LIFO, last, last in, first out. So that's the definition of stack. You might be, you, you might be probably you, you've heard a lot of, about this, but I believe that this visual representation really helps much better to understand how it works. And now uh, from the pointer perspective, uh, so let's go one more thin. So uh, currently a stack pointer points here and once we uh, initialize, uh, once we do the initial push, uh, it actually, what it does, it uploads the data to the uh, memory, memory location where the stack pointer is pointing to. So this is what just happened. So it just uploaded the data. And then the next thing happens is the stack pointer uh, drops one value down so it was one f f and now it it is one f e so it just it has just been decremented by one so stack growth downwards and by the way that's exactly the same thing that happens in in x86 assembly as well right so now we just the next step we initialize the new value for a register and the next uh, uh, the next step we again push this uh, so now the stack so now, now we've pushed the value and the stack pointer is here now when it comes to pool uh, the order is a little bit different so let's first uh, reset the a register so now when I push now, now when I uh, press step so it first uh, increments the stack pointer and then it fetches the data and again it first increments and then fetches the data so the difference is when it pushes it first uh, uploads the data and then shifts the pointer like goes downwards but when he pulls it guns on the country it first increments the pointer and then uh, fetches the value from the corresponding memory cell the stack pointer is pointing to so that's all you need to know about uh, about stack for now and also uh, if a certain instruction affects the stack pointer that is uh, clearly explicitly uh, being said uh, in the documentation but just uh just another uh like most common case for this so function calls so uh literally a function call so so how it works so why so this uh, temporary temporary storage of values is just a good visual example of how we can make use of stack but uh the most common case and like how the stack is usually used is uh, in order to implement the function calls so let's say uh we uh, here somewhere uh so we don't even let, let's say we don't let's drop assembly commands for now let's say we want to just uh, call our function f right and here we have like let's say like some function f and here we have some data 
and then we just return from this right so what happens right so when we call the function the instruction pointer goes to the function it jumps there and then when he finds the return command uh, the instruction pointer goes back now the question is uh, we need to so where do we store uh, the program counter uh, the address that program counter has been pointing to before uh, going to another location where the function exists so the stack is the answer so it pushes the value of where the program counter was to the stack then goes to the function does the job there and by executing the return it actually restores uh, uh, the program counter value that was previously stored there and it just returns here so it works like this so it goes in this instruction this one this one then function call it jumps to the functions makes everything needed there return so it drops back and then it resumes the execution from here for instance if we're going to be using um, just a bare unconditional jumps so from here we just jump here then in order to get back here we need a, a, a specific label there and here instead of return we'll have we will have a jump command uh, containing the relative set of bytes that we need to do in order to get back here so that's not the most convenient way at some point also let's say you want to implement the recursion so it's not going to be working like this and function calls will so that's uh the most common usage for a stack for a stack so i'm sorry for not using the actual commands so the actual commands are jump uh uh yeah jst right and jsr uh, where is the JST? No JS. Hold on a sec. Uh, yeah, I'm just not familiar with the specific names yet. JSR. Oh yeah, this is a jump to subroutine. Yeah, jump to subroutine. Uh, so th this is you. You can think of this as instruction just as a function call that I've been just mentioning. And also there there is a command somewhere to return from subroutine so maybe sr uh some point uh subroutine yeah uh, rts return from subroutine yeah so yeah, i really need to get used to these names for fun uh, uh, for the instructions yeah so uh all the assembly languages operate the same and the thinking is very similar it's just a matter of having a different instruction set different number of registers different uh logic of how this works internally but the overall general concepts are all ver very similar okay so we don't really need this function stuff here right and let me just make sure that it did cover everything so we've covered random numbers user input uh, memory monitor program counter stack pointer video memory that's pretty much all about it right so this is the entire this is the entire um, set of knowledge that you need to have in order to develop for this particular simulator and starting from the next video uh, we will actually dive into the instructions themselves and uh, we'll learn how they work what are the addressing modes and things like that and when we when we'll fill when we feel that we are good enough at these instructions we'll then try to write some simple apps or maybe even games for this console just just for fun just to practice because uh you know like uh, when i try to write something I could actually write something for this console it turned out to be uh not really that trivial so it's challenging it's really fun and i don't know i think this is one of the most useful experiences for me personally uh in regards to assembly language so I highly recommend you guys to do this as well and to learn this x502 and despite uh, like uh, unlikely the x86 which has more than 3000 instructions in our days if I'm not mistaken it's really a huge amount so you can wrap wrap your hand around them all here we have only 56 instructions and we don't even need to use all of them but they are very logical and uh, as this was stated by uh, Nick Morgan so the main difference I just want to give a quotation here so the, the the main difference yeah by the way here is uh 
uh, I'll, I will, uh, I'll give a link to this uh, tutorial in the description below the video as well. Uh, so he says, then why 6502? Why not a useful assembly language like, uh, like x86? And he says, he doesn't think it's useful and I'm, I, com I completely agree. Uh, and because you don't really probably most likely won't need to write this in your daily job. And this is a purely an academic exercise. Uh, 6502 was originally written in a different age, a time when the majority of developers were writing assembly directly rather than in these new flagged high-level programming languages. So it was designed to be written by humans. Unlikely, more, more modern assembly languages are meant to, uh, written by, to be written by compilers. So let's leave it to that. And that's so true, guys. You know, like... Uh, I can compare now my experience on x86 and in 6502 and you really feel like a human because yeah it's it's very fun experience and I highly recommend trying that okay so this is it from my side I hope you learned something interesting out of this tutorial and starting from uh, the next video we will dive uh, directly into the most basic instructions of 6502 assembly and then we'll see how it goes. So this is it from my side. Thanks for watching. Until the next time and take care.